Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. I'm Anthony Kent. And I'm Derek Morris. And whether you're a full-time pastor or a lay leader in your congregation, God wants you to be a great Christian leader. And Anthony, our topic today, so powerful, so relevant for 21st century Christian leaders. Of course, Derek. We're looking at why public evangelism is important in the 21st century. And I'm excited about our guest as well. Well, I'm most excited. Whenever we get a great guest, I know it's going to be a great program. So Sean comes with credentials as someone who's been a powerful evangelist. And continues. We're, of course, we're talking about Sean Boonstra. He has had a, a long history in public evangelism, highly respected, highly regarded, highly gifted. So I'm very much looking forward to him joining our program today. And I think it will be helpful not only for people who may feel a call to full-time evangelism, but for every Christian leader. It's going to be really practical today. Exactly. And in fact, what we're really exploring as well is how the church fits into this into a public evangelism as well. And we're delighted that you've joined us. We'll be back with Sean Boonstra right after this break. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is why public evangelism is important in the 21st century. And our guest is Pastor Sean Boonstra. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Anthony. It's great to be here. It's, it's always fun to sit down and talk about the subject I love most, evangelism. Of course. Now, Sean, just tell us a little. Some of our viewers will need little no, or no introduction to, to you, your, your ministry and so forth. But just share with us just a, a little of what you've done and what you're currently doing. Well, I really haven't done anything, but I, I feel privileged that God has allowed me to be involved in evangelism since the day I gave my own heart to the Lord. Um, you know, it was within becoming within three weeks of becoming a Christian that I gave somebody a Bible study for the first time. And within three months, I held a public evangelistic meeting. It was small and it was frightening. But since that time, I've been, I mean, I haven't, I can't imagine a time that went by when I wasn't doing those things. I got hooked. And so it's been a couple of decades now and six continents later, I'm still doing what God loves for us to do is share Jesus with people. And it looks like you're enjoying it, Sean. This is wonderful. I do love it. Yeah, of course. Now, our topic today, why public evangelism is important in the 21st century. Right. And I think we, we've talked a little about this and we've come up with at least nine good reasons. Oh, yeah, I think we could go all day on reasons that we ought to do this. But um, I think it's important to address it, Anthony, because I've heard some people express doubt that that is still a mode of sharing the gospel in the 21st century. Um, I had somebody write me the other day saying, really, I've been talking to other ministers and they say relational evangelism or social media, these things have replaced public evangelistic meetings, they've displaced it, there's no need for them anymore. Is that true? And I guess I'd never even anticipated the question, you know, 20 years of public evangelism, I assumed we all knew it was important, mm. but uh, I've been doing some thinking and you're right, there's at least nine, probably thousands, but at least nine. Yeah. So let's, let's hear the, the alternate perspective then, Sean. Lead us. What's the first reason, good reason why you would give why a church should do public evangelism in the 21st century? Well, you know, I think it has to do with what Jesus asked the church to do in the first place. He said, go take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts chapter 1, mm -hmm. uh, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, Revelation 14, the great gospel commission, till every nation is heard. And when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us that we all have a role to play in that. We've all been gifted by the Spirit to participate in that process and uh, nobody's got all the gifts of the Spirit, and not one believer has none of them. Everybody's got something, and they're meant for us to work together in harmony. Now, often in a church's life, members will drift from year to year and church event to church event, from bake sale to bake sale, wondering, how does my gift relate to the rest of these believers? When a church gets involved in public evangelism, it takes a great deal of organization, and it suddenly thrusts all of us as church members together, if we want to do it right. Mm -hmm and have some success, we have to get together and see how our gifts work with each other. It provides a little microcosm of what's supposed to go on day by day in the church. And in a very focused way, suddenly I realize, you know what? 
If I've got the gift of hospitality, it can work in the process of evangelism exactly here. Or if I'm a great teacher, maybe I can help with the baptismal class over here. Everybody gets to try out their gifts and see how they work in harmony with each other in an environment that produces very quick results. I mean, it's tangible. You, you, you put on a meeting for a week or a weekend or a month and you see the results. You see people uh, mm -hmm. accepting Christ, walking into the baptistry because you and I work together and my gifts complemented yours. So it gives the church a microcosm, a much needed microcosm that helps every believers see that yes indeed they're a minister with gifts that need to be used. So you're describing here that the, the benefit is really for the church, the local church. Oh, there's no question about yeah. it. You know, God doesn't actually need us for evangelism. He could handle it. Mm. I believe it's the school of faith. God says, go take on the world. And you look out the window and say, that's too big. Mm. Uh, and what he's trying to do is teach us faith. We're going to need it when we live in the kingdom of heaven. He's not going to tell us everything the day we arrive. We're still going to have to trust God. Working together, following God's lead induces faith, and yes, it's for the health of the church. Right. So that's point one? Yeah, that was point one. Okay. What's our second reason? Well, the, the, the second reason ties kind of into it. I, I heard um, somebody say the other day, listen, uh, relational evangelism is what it's all about. Public evangelism is gone. And as an evangelist, I'll tell you right now, uh, I don't want to hold evangelistic meetings, if I can help it, in a church where there is no relational evangelism of any kind. I will often go to a church and visit their potluck, not because I like potluck. I actually don't really like potluck that much. I'm sorry, everybody, but I just, I just don't. The reason I go there when I'm contemplating, will I hold evangelistic meetings for this church? I want to count the number of non-believers that are at the potluck. Okay. Do they know anybody? Mm -hmm. Now, if I had to choose relational evangelism or public evangelism, I'd lean on relational because it's ongoing and sustainable, um, but it's not either or. Let's say we put everything in the relational basket, and let's say you had a church of, I don't know, 200 members, and you live in a city of 20,000, a nice small American city, mm -hmm. or a large city in some parts of Canada where I grew up. What's the sphere of influence of the average church member? It can be limited, can't it? Uh, absolutely. You yeah. know, if you've got 200 members, what are the odds that every church member knows 10 people well enough to invite them to Christ? Yeah. 10. Now you're up to 2,000 and you're still leaving out 90% of the community. The sphere of influence is actually rather small if we just rely on the local church members. Who's going to reach those that we don't know? Mm. Uh, in fact, who's going to reach those that are nothing like us? We tend to hang out with people that are like us, and so we keep baptizing people who are like us. So relational evangelism picks up a lot of family and friends and close acquaintances and people who are a lot like, who's going to reach the rest? If we had relied on relational evangelism alone, I may not be here today because I came at the invitation of a public evangelistic meeting, and I might not have come to anything else. So right. the sphere of influence sometimes in a church is just too small. So that's a great point that you've brought up, Sean. So public evangelism really helps a church enlarge its sphere of influence and make a bigger impact upon the community. Absolutely. Pushes you right out in public. Exactly. That's two of our topics, uh, two of our points. We're going to be back with some more points why public evangelism is important in the 21st century. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our guest today is Pastor Sean Boonstra and our topic is why public evangelism is important in the 21st century. In our earlier segment, Sean, we looked at two points. And our third point is that public evangelism can often provide a safe and neutral place. Explore that yeah, for us. Absolutely. And I'm particularly thinking of people like me when I, I think about that. There's a lot to be said for small group evangelism, personal intimate gatherings, and building on relationship. There's a huge segment of the population we're going to reach that way. But there's another segment of the population, guys like me, who aren't going to show up for it. We, we're going to think right out of the gate when we get invited, that's too touchy-feely for me. We're going to think, what do they want? We're suspicious, and we'd rather slip into somewhere neutral. Kind of like the way we run the television with the remote control, we don't want to lose control. I want to sit there, and if I don't like it, I want to be able to go. And we can be one in a crowd, yeah. come and go as we please, That's and, right. and just be invisible in a sense. That's right. I can come and check it out. Yeah. Um, and that's the biblical approach. Come and see, it was said to Nathaniel. Come yeah. and see. Acquire some information and then stay or move on if they, if they choose. Yeah, it was actually how I was one, and so I'm a big believer in it. <laughs> good, good. Now, our fourth point, 
Sean, relates to communication. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has to do with the fact that a lot of people are putting a lot of weight on social media, suggesting that perhaps Facebook and Twitter are now taking the place of, um, of you know, public evangelism. But communication, as most people know, is 85, 90% visual. As I'm communicating with you in email or Twitter or some other environment like that, how do I know how you're receiving my words? So if I'm the evangelist and I have an audience, I can tell if the point's getting across because I try and look everybody in the eye in the mm -hmm. course of a sermon, mm -hmm. everybody in the eye. I know whether it's registering or not, whether they're angry or they're smiling, and that is often missing in uh, the Twitter, uh, Twitterverse. Even, even coughs can be a signal. You oh, know, yeah. you can it look sure for can. yawns, you can look for nodding heads. <laughs> it's all communication. Body language. Yeah. There, there's a reason, you know, that real estate gurus, they put ads on TV and ads in the paper, but they still call you down to the hotel on a Sunday morning for a one-on-one one -on -one seminar. Why? Because they know they're going to sell you uh, what they're selling a lot better if they can make eye contact. Exactly. Now, our fifth point is about being cohesive and putting logical points in line. Explore that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for us to imagine, but back in the day when Abraham Lincoln was running for president, he used to speak for two hours uninterrupted to make his point. Whoa. Yeah, I know. That's, and that's some point. Three hours, and the audience, whether they were farmers or lawyers, would sit there and listen and hear it all the way through. Now, in the social media environment and other interactive environments, we're used to cutting each other off. We cut each other off with every point that's made. And you only get 140 characters on Twitter to make a point and somebody rebuts. But they wouldn't rebut if you were given a chance to explain yourself from beginning to end. So when you get to speak for 40 or 45 minutes and people will listen, you get to make the whole point and most of the questions evaporate. They can see the whole context, the whole thing. And you know, this is still used frequently in the community, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, country leaders do it, presidents, prime oh, ministers, sure. and so forth. It's, it's the typical method of learning, um, adult learning in universities and so forth. So this is not an outdated form. It's still a significant yeah. form of communication. Make the whole gospel presentation. Exactly. Don't get rebutted on every point. Public evangelism gives that opportunity to explain it all at once. Yeah. Now, the sixth point that we want to explore is about bringing people to Jesus Christ and making a decision. Share with us how public evangelism helps with that. Well, evangelism is more than just conveying facts and information. There comes a point where God has entrusted us to make an appeal to people, to invite them into God's kingdom, to invite them to accept Christ. Now, all of us are ministers in the church. All of us have gifts for evangelism, but not everybody's a natural, for lack of a better term, not, not everybody's a natural closer. Not everybody mm. knows how to make that appeal. Mm. And so there's a time and a place where we can all gather and bring our friends that we've been working with where someone who's been gifted as an evangelist, one of the gifts of the Spirit, mm. makes that appeal, calls for decision. And uh, the members can see how it's done well by somebody who's been gifted that way. And they can bring their friends if they don't know how to ask. The evangelist can ask. Yeah. Um, it's, and it provides an atmosphere where people make decisions. When I see someone else make a decision, my heart softens a little bit. There's a time to bring everyone together and to have someone who's gifted call for that decision. And that's an important part, isn't it, Sean? Oh, yeah. You, you know, because the, this, you're describing here a community at work. You're describing a church and a person with the spiritual gift of evangelism working uh, to, to lead people to discover eternal life. Absolutely. You know, it, it, I may have spent the last 20 years in public evangelism, but I still go to hear every evangelist I can because I've often wondered, how could I really appeal to somebody on, who's dealing with this kind of a problem. And then I hear somebody do it well. And I'm thinking, well, that's why it didn't work when I tried. I did it poorly. But listen to that approach and I learn from it. There's something that happens that we can learn from an evangelist who's been gifted that way and leave it. All of us can leave that event better for it and better skilled and equipped. Exactly. And you know, as I, as I listen to you make these points, Sean, I'm not hearing that it's public evangelism or oh, relational no. evangelism. No. You know. No, you know what, if, if I have a public evangelistic meeting and 90% of the people who come know a church member, I'm smiling because it's going to be a phenomenal meeting. It's not and or, it's both. Uh, yeah. It's not either or, it's both and. Exactly. And that's precisely what Jesus role modeled and the early church role modeled as well. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Well, we've made how many points? We're up to six. We've done six. We've got at least three to go. Stay right with us. We'll be back with more of these points in Ministry in Motion.
Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our guest today is Pastor Sean Boonstra and our topic, why public evangelism is important in the 21st century. Now, Sean, we've made six good points and we've got three to go. Just remind us quickly of the six points that we've made. Okay. Well, first of all, um, it enables every church member to exercise their gifts in community in a focused way. Excellent. Okay. Second one. Number two, uh, it broadens the influence of the church. Our personal influence is often too small in a community. Right. Number three, um, there are a number of people who hold intimacy in, in sus they hold it suspect. They're not going to show up for what they perceive to be too intimate too fast. So they want a neutral place to and come a safe and place. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay, fourthly, communication is visual. If we rely on social media and the internet and some other things that don't enable us to see the response, we're not going to communicate as effectively. Right. So public auditoriums do that. Psychologists still have you come down to their office, right? And uh, salesmen still hold events in the hotel. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the fifth one? Fifth one, it allows you to present the whole gospel in a cohesive and uninterrupted fashion so that people can hear the whole thing before they weigh in and find their objections. Excellent. And our sixth one? It enables members to bring their personal interests and friends to somebody who may have a God-given gift to help them, uh, to help appeal for decision, whereas the average church member might be afraid to do that. Excellent. Okay, now our seventh one is about priorities. Yeah, it really is. All right. How does it help a local church with its priorities, Sean? Well, it's one thing to discuss the gospel in a class. I I've seen this happen sometimes. They'll read a study about the religious thinking in America and bring the study to a class where believers sit around, discuss the findings, and then they decide in that class what's important to communicate to those people in, out there in the general public based on a study. Mm -hmm. A study is not a real person. Mm. It, you, you have to take the gospel message and go test what you believe against the general public. It, I know it's scary. It takes away the safety net, right? Mm. But if I go out and invite the community and everybody comes from every walk of life, young and old, believer, unbeliever, you know, Buddhist, atheist, everybody shows up, I have to test the claims of the gospel and my understanding of it against the general community and I very quickly find out what's important to communicate and what doesn't matter to those people because they're real. They're not a study. They're real people. So it sounds like a, it's a, another learning experience for the church as well where they're understanding the community offering to the community and building relationships with the community. Absolutely. You know, Anthony, I love seminary classes. I still sit, you know, iTunes is wonderful, free seminary classes. And you can, you can I, I love those classes, but the greatest classroom on earth is the public. Yeah. They'll bring questions I'd never thought of. They'll bring issues in their life I never dreamt of having to deal with myself. And I'm forced to the Bible in my knees uh, to learn. And it's the greatest school on earth. Excellent. Okay, our eighth reason is that it gives us an insight into what we might ne not necessarily see. It's beyond ourselves. Oh yeah, this one, this one is amazing. Uh, I think it's Peter who writes that you know, angels desire to look into these things. And mm. um, Paul says we're a spectacle to the universe. In the book of Job, Satan shows up and God says, where have you been? Well, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. He's not just telling God where he was. He's laid claim to the earth. I'm about out in my new property. He's on his turf. He's other. on his turf, right? Yeah. I'm walking on it. I own it. That's a very powerful symbol in the ancient world. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? Is there any like him? And he says that in front of this huge audience of heavenly beings. Mm. Hey, everybody's watching. Yeah. Noah preaches and has what you and I might consider minimal results. You know, 120 years of preaching, eight family members. I think that's phenomenal, well worth it. But if we were to put it against today's standards, we'd say, what a failure, 120 years. Uh, you know, that's not even a convert a decade. And yet Noah preached. And we all instinctively know he would have been unfaithful had he not preached. Mm. In this universe where God's government has been challenged by fallen angels saying God's not fit to rule and nobody would choose God of their own free will if they were given a choice, it does something. Even if I were to go out and preach publicly and not one convert came, never happens, mm. but not one convert comes, I've still been faithful to God and that declaration allows heaven to say, see of their own free will these people believe and they're telling the story to the gospel, of the gospel to the whole world. They're uncovering the devil's lies and nobody has any excuse. There's so much that happens in the universe even if nobody did convert. They always do. But something else, we're not the only players in the game. Exactly. You know, Sean, you've led us neatly into our ninth point. I know. This one's the big one, isn't it? It is. 
there's a biblical reason, isn't there, why we do public evangelism? Yeah, because it is the biblical mandate. Yeah. Um, if you take a look, I mean, here's this unbroken tradition. I struggle with this idea that all of a sudden public preaching of the gospel is defunct in the 21st century, when for 2,000 years of Christian history, it was the primary way that every revival in Christian history for 2,000 years was preceded by and grown by public preaching, every single one of them. Why? Because those people, those men and women who were leading people to Christ for 2,000 years understood what the Bible says, go and preach, go and share this with the world. Public proclamation is profoundly biblical. Look mm -hmm. at the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. On the day of Pentecost, they could have broken into small group discussions, but Peter stood up, and nothing wrong with small group discussions, but Peter stood up and preached the word when that audience was there. It was time. And you see preaching again and again and again. Jesus worked with people intimately, but he also gathered large crowds like he did on the mount and publicly proclaimed the gospel. It's what we've been asked to do. It is profoundly biblical, and if we had no other reasons, Anthony, I'd have to go out and preach on the fact that it's biblical. Exactly. And you know, even 21st century, people will still gather together in large crowds to hear a message. It oh, happens will. from time to time in the political level for, for other events, major events. So it's, it's not completely, you know, something that belongs to a foreign era. It still belongs to the 21st century. My personal experience is, is that crowds are bigger now. All, I mean, they're getting larger, not smaller. Exactly. They will come and hear the gospel. People are hungry. It's been missing from an entire generation's lives. Yeah. And they'll come. Yeah. Okay. Thanks ever so much, Sean. Anytime. Just as we conclude this, eve this program, there's a very special offer I'd like to make to our viewers. Fantastic. Uh, everyone knows that our program is called Ministry in Motion. And one of the reasons why we called it Ministry in Motion, of course, was because of its connection with Ministry, the journal. Right. Ministry is a journal for pastors of all denominations. It's been going since 1928, which is quite a significant period. Nearly a hundred. And we'd like to make this offer. We've got a, a sample right there on the table and I might reach over and, and share it with our viewers. If you're a pastor and you've been enjoying Ministry in Motion, write to us. Write to us at our email address, feedback at ministryinmotion.tv and you may be eligible to receive a complimentary subscription to Ministry the Journal. This journal goes to some 200 countries around the world. There are some 60,000 pastors that are receiving ministry and being blessed by it. So write to us. Tell us what you're doing in your ministry. Tell us a little about your church. And uh, we'd be delighted to offer a complimentary subscription to you. If you're not a pastor, perhaps you're a, a local lay leader or a volunteer in your local church, we have something for you as well. We have some vast resources that are on our website. Come and visit our website, ministryinmotion.tv, and we have some further resources there for you as well. Sean, once again, thanks so much for, oh, for leading Thank us in our discussion. Me. We'll take you up on that. We'd love to have you back. But until next time, we want you to know that we're thinking of you. Ministry in Motion is here for you and we're praying for your ministry. May God richly bless you.